Go. Ladies and gentlemen, recently I've been thinking a lot about travel. I think maybe it is the influence of the pandemic, but I've been thinking a lot about travel. In the past, I think we, may, we might have taken tourism and travel for granted. And we're asking a lot of questions about what will travel be like after the pandemic? When will we be able to travel properly again? And I thought back about my childhood because when I was a child, I spent all of my pocket money on travel books. For birthday, for Christmas, I would ask my mum and dad to buy me travel books. I would spend hours and hours reading about Abu Simbel, the Galapagos Islands, Yosemite National Park, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And all of these travel books inspired me so much. In fact, travel was actually why I learned Spanish in the first place. When I was young, the number one place I wanted to go to was Peru because I wanted to see Machu Picchu. I wanted to go on the Inca Trail. And that's actually why I learned Spanish because I was so fascinated by the cultures of Latin America and in particular, the culture of Peru. And I thought that by learning Spanish, that would unlock a whole fascinating continent to me. This continent that held so much mystery for me. And as we all know, as interpreters, languages really are the key to understanding culture and history. They give us the opportunity to visit those places that we've wanted to go to for so long. Unfortunately, I still actually haven't had the opportunity to go to Peru and Latin America, but learning Spanish has taken me on a different journey, not a physical one, but a linguistic one, a cultural one, a literary one, one that is just as exciting in many ways. I think when I was younger, I had a, a very active imagination, shall we say, because when I was reading these books, I would envisage myself visiting Caribbean islands, tasting mangoes, feeling a shiver of excitement at seeing mountain gorillas in the Congo, or seeing the massive kaleidoscope of colors underwater in the Great Barrier Reef. And that's always what traveling has meant to me. It's, I might be being a bit idealistic here, but travel has always been synonymous of discovery and excitement. So I've been thinking a lot about travel and why do we travel? Well, as interpreters, we might travel because we have assignments in other countries. We might travel to other countries because we want to learn another language or add another C language or improve our A or B languages. But why do we travel in general? Do we travel to broaden our minds, to broaden our horizons? Do we do it to get away from ourselves or conversely find ourselves? Do we do it to undergo rites of passage or celebrate our union with the planet and its peoples? There are many questions going around my head here, but I think often today we, we travel just because we can. We travel because uh, travel has become so cheap. The world has become so small. Companies like EasyJet and Ryanair offer very cheap flights and within a few hours at most 48 hours you can suddenly find yourself on the other side of the world there's something really exciting about that but traveling just because you can isn't a very romantic idea is it it's not the idea of the authentic all-consuming classic journey and that's what I want to talk about after all, Marco Polo is widely credited as one of the earliest tourists, so to speak. He brought back to Venice tales of lands that nobody had ever dreamt of. He went to places so exotic and otherworldly that his tales meant that he was actually branded a liar. He was a, a prophet without honor, if you like, in his own land. And if you think about it, he really was the first tourist. He set the stage for many to come. He inspired many travelers. He inspired them to travel just for travel's sake. We often think about the negatives of travel. We think about it uh, leading to climate change. We think about the environmental footprint and we should think about those things. Definitely, we should travel more responsibly. But I would like to propose the idea that travel appeals to an inherent adventurous spirit in humanity. It's this thrill of throwing off the trappings of modern life and just experiencing the planet in its infinite variety and beauty. I think for one thing, journeys are often epic. Journeys are epic, they can be epic in many ways. They can be epic in scale, in physicality, in significance, in scenery. 
For example, when you stared down at the mighty fjords or glaciers in Norway, you might think that everything, even your own problems, pale into insignificance. And when you're staring up at the pyramids in Egypt, incidentally, the only ancient wonder of the wonder of the ancient world still standing, you might have that same sensation. But I also think travel in many ways is, is about our desire to understand our place in the universe. If you think about it, that is what humans have always done. They've always searched for the seemingly unobtainable. Humans have always wanted to see what lay beyond. You can actually, I suppose, draw a parallel here between traveling and, and interpreting. I think interpreting appeals to that desire to do something unobtainable, the idea of being able to speak a language and listen to a different language at the same time. So you can draw a parallel here between travel and, and interpreting even. But yes, I think it's that search for the seemingly unobtainable. And I also want to suggest something else that maybe that spirit of great exploration which inspired people like Marco Polo isn't actually dead. There might not be more lands to discover. You might have discovered them all. But I think that spirit of great exploration is there. It's just in a different form. After all, nobody rides the Orient Express with the express intent of advancing the human race or maybe not consciously anyway. But trains actually, I'm gonna open an interesting parenthesis here. Uh, train journeys actually do kind of evoke that nostalgia. Trains are slow, they take their time. They transport us back to an era when most travel was for pleasure and where most travel for pleasure was actually enabled by rail. So there's the idea of nostalgia there. But I think it's also about curiosity. I think humans have this idea of of adventure and I think this is hardwired into our collective consciousness. We are essentially migratory creatures after all as well as social ones and often journeys were and are undertaken to satisfy our social and curious urges. I think we love to connect with other lands, with other people, we like to imbibe the rituals of other cultures and you can kind of see it as a sort of marriage, a sort of mingling with uh, or marriage rather between things from another culture and things of our own, things of our own that we cherish. We often hear it said that humans at the moment are time poor, the idea of being time poor. It's the idea that nobody has enough time to do anything of lasting duration. And that explains the rise of things like slow food, slow travel, slow movements. These movements have emerged in response to a society which is moving so rapidly and changing at such a, a scary pace in many ways. But travel and travel can be slow as well. After all, it might be a while before we can actually travel again. But even if we can't travel physically, I think we can travel in our imagination. It's like what I was saying when I was talking at the start about how I would read these travel books. And although I couldn't like visit these places, I could imagine them. I could go on a journey in my own mind and my imagination. For example, we won't ever be able to accomplish what Amelia Earhart did. We can't recreate her incredible plane journey around the globe. But reading about it is no less inspirational. We can recreate in our minds what that travel must have been like for her, what it must have been like to fall at the last hurdle. And it is much like my desire to go to Peru, really. I haven't actually been there. But those travels in my imagination, those travels in my head to Machu Picchu, to the cusps of the Andes peaks, sent me on another journey, a linguistic one, a cultural one, a literary one. I've been learning Spanish for, for many years now, and I've loved every single step along that journey. Along the way, I have met literary figures such as Gabriel García Márquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, um, Maria Luisa Bombal, these figures who have been my companions, so to speak, for quite a few years now. So travel doesn't always have to be physical. And I think especially in times of COVID, we can enjoy the benefits of travel in different ways. You don't even have to be physically removed. There are many ways of satisfying that adventurous spirit, that thirst for, for a quest, if you like. So I feel like I should probably add some science in here so that this speech is not just me rambling about my own feelings and thoughts. So here goes. On a different note, scientists have produced evidence which shows the therapeutic value of travel. 
Actually, getting away from it all opens up neural pathways, which actually helps stave off Alzheimer's and dementia. Actually, travel can produce very positive and effective thinking patterns. For example, when you're in a new country, you might be confronted with challenges like trying to read road signs in an unknown language. You might have to deal with a confusing transport timetable, for example. And all of these challenges force us to think in new and unexpected ways. It's almost like our brains have to rewire in order to acclimatize to our, our new environment. So I think arriving in a new country is both thrilling and disorientating. But grappling with the mysteries and complexities of another culture can actually help unlock a hidden dimension of creativity in our minds. It makes you feel like you can solve problems that before seemed unsurmountable, insurmountable rather. So it is no wonder really that such great literature was derived from journeys. Think about Frankenstein, for example. Frankenstein was written by Mary Shelley during her travels on the Grand Tour. Joseph Conrad wrote Heart of Darkness while traveling in the Congo. Many future leaders like Che Guevara, for example, returned from their great journeys with ideas that would literally change the world and literally change the course of history. So at the end of the day, traveling leads to a kind of positive disorientation, I think. And that positive disorientation can come from contemplating sheer beauty, sheer beauty from Niagara Falls to the Nile. I also think that traveling, whether real or imaginary, gives food for dreams. And I think we could all do with a few more dreams. I think we could all do with a bit more dreaming. So in conclusion, if you're thinking that this speech is quite cheesy and quite sickly sweet, I really don't blame you. I really, really don't. Uh, when I reread it this morning, I realized that actually it was quite cheesy. But I hope that at least this speech maybe will have brightened up your mood and made you reflect on the next trip you would like to go on after COVID when we can travel again. But actually I have to admit that the motivation behind giving this speech wasn't really that selfless because when I was giving, when I was preparing this speech last night, I reopened all my old travel books that I'd been bought when I was, when I was a little girl. And just looking at those travel books made me dream again and Dreaming, well, I think dreaming is always good. Thank you for listening.